Iruhana. She is a CEO of Diabetes Study of Maldives, which is the only NGO that dedicated to diabetes awareness and care in the country. And she's working in the sector for more than 20 years. And currently she is the president of Maldives NCD Alliance and member of the advisory committee, faculty of health science of, of Maldives National University. So Ashad, the mic is the whole as is yours. Good evening. I, I hope you can hear my voice. Yeah. Yes, we can. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, I have been asked to talk about uh, how we uh, manage uh, diabetes care in a uh, low resourceful country. I'll try to share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Are you able yeah. to? See my yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I, uh, I have been uh, looking and hearing the previous uh, uh, speakers, and I have been uh, seeing a lot of informa informative sessions about the technologies, about the uh, latest technologies, CGMs, and all. Uh, I, I, uh, my presentation uh, might be a little bit different from others because I. Hi. Hello. Yes, please, doctor. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I will just uh, try to talk about how, how our country is and how, as an NGO working in uh, in the Maldives, how we try to uh, provide the necessary care for the for the diabetes patients and also run the awareness and screening program in the country. I'll just. Uh, uh, try to introduce Maldives. I'm sure uh, almost everyone here knows about Maldives, but I will just try to uh, uh, introduce uh, how we are. So we are uh, a country with 20 atolls and a number of at atolls, in, uh, islands in each of the atolls. So at present, uh, there are about uh, 188 inhabited islands in, in these 20 atolls. Um, uh, Coming to our health system, our health system is di divided into different tiers where we have uh, five tertiary hospitals, four regional hospitals, 14 natural hospitals, and 120, 172 health centers. Moving on, I'll just like to highlight to you how our health system is. As you can see here, uh, this is Male, which is the capital of the country, and almost all the tertiary hospitals are here in 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 the capital. Uh, there are two tertiary hospitals which were declared as tertiary hospitals, which has been upgraded, which was done uh, since the COVID. So when uh, the COVID pandemic started, we had only the tertiary hospitals available were only in the capital of the country, and the capital of the country was in a total lockdown for mm, around two and a half months. So uh, uh, moving on to our role, what is the role of NGOs? So there are many NGOs and COs, uh, CSOs working at the national and regional levels. And uh, the NGOs are really formed to fill the gap identified within the government. Uh, like these uh, NGOs offer services at different levels. Some include awareness programs, prevention programs. And there are some NGOs who uh, provide, who offer patient care to some level as well. And then moving on to us, uh, we are the Diabetes uh, Society of Maldives. Um, we were formed in 2002, and uh, there was uh, an aware awareness of a need uh, to educate the public on diabetes, to educate the uh, public on uh, how, about uh, the prevention of diabetes, importance of uh, early diagnosis, and then also there was a, a, a very much higher need for patient care to improve the care of the patients uh, throughout the country and to, act, uh, to have someone to act as a center of information on diabetes in the country. 
So uh, Diabetes Society was formed in 2000 because of this. Uh, we have been working in the um, country for almost 20 years and we have achieved a uh, lot uh, during these years. So coming to us, uh, we try to uh, offer different services in different aspects of diabetes uh, within the country, like we have a uh, clinic which is based in the capital of the country, and this is the only clinic um, especially for diabetes patients and we, it's a free clinic. We do a lot of screening awareness programs uh, within the um, at all as well. We do a training of diabetes educators. We have a Save a Diabetic project. We also try to offer psych psychological support for patients. And also we run a, a camp for youth with diabetes. Going on to our screening and uh, awareness programs, uh, uh, we started screening and awareness programs in 2002, and we do uh, a lot of programs in the islands, in the atolls, in workplaces, in the offices, and we, uh, other than blood sugar, we do, uh, we do calculate the high risk level through and through measures and also behavior risk and risk stratification as well. And I just wanted to point out that very frequently in our screening programs, new cases of diabetes and other NCDs, including uh, high blood pressure, are identified in the health, in the screening programs in these health camps. Mm. Looking at the number of uh, screen populations starting from 2004, we have screened about 47,785 uh, people uh, in, in the screening programs. And uh, looking at uh, some data from these screening programs, uh, you can see that the prevalence of type 2 diabetes is like 8.1% of the population. We have heart disease as 3.1, hypertension as 14.9. But looking at the um, obesity level, 13.5. And But we have a very high overweight level of 67.7. 67% of the population are identified as overweight. And then when we do the high risk score, we have a 62.5% of the population that we have screened uh, identified as high risk for diabetes, uh, which uh, without an intervention might go on to uh, be diabetic within the next five to 10 years. So uh, looking at, I will be using this uh, chart, uh, this chart of the models as because this, uh, we have a very hard time uh, um, like explaining to people how our country is. So this is how our country is. So I will be using this uh, chart a lot. So looking at the prevalence, there are very high prevalence in different areas of the country and very low prevalence uh, in some areas of the country. And then I would like to distinguish the fact here that in according to our screening programs, like uh, we do not really see a higher prevalence in like maybe uh, the urban or rural as such, but we, maybe because of the um, uh, family history and such, some there are uh, higher prevalence in some parts of the country. Mm, uh, because as I told, as I have mentioned before, our islands are scattered all over um, the job, uh, all over, and there are like there might be around 500 or 1,000 persons in one island, and there might be around 5,000 persons in one island, depending on how the, the island is located. So it was a, it was a very big challenge for us. We being uh, situated in the capital, our NGO being situated in the capital, and our clinic being situated in the capital, it was a very big challenge for us to provide the necessary care, the education, and also we um, uh, came up with a project called Project 200 Islands. When we started this project, there were 200 islands where people were living, but now it has gone down to around 188. 
So and the challenges were very obvious. There were a lot of logistic challenges. There was access to quality. There was no access to quality healthcare uh, in the context of diabetes. There was no awareness sessions. There were no patient care available. So we came up with a project called Project 200 Island, uh, which was funded by the World Diabetes Foundation, where we try to educate one educator per, per island so that there would be one person who would, who would be able to take care of the diabetic population or who would be allies with us in each of the islands. So we started this project in September 200, uh, two, 2009 and we, it took us around two and a half years to, pro, uh, to finish this project. And by the end of this project, there was one educator in each island of the country. So this, these educators play a very important role in uh, they, uh, they provide the, the necessary education. They try to provide the management of the patient and care in the islands. And also they form a very important link between the islands and uh, uh, at, at the capital. So uh, I would go on uh, to our clinic. So we have a free clinic in the capital of the country where pro we provide the diabetes, we do the complications, we do the investigation, uh, we, do, we give advice on diet and exercise, we do uh, mental health um, counseling sessions as well, and then we also do consultations if it is required. Mm. So at, at the moment in our clinic, we have a total of uh, 1,919 people registered and our average patient is like 10 people per day. Uh, we have 136 type 1 registered patients. And then uh, I, I would just like to highlight the fact that uh, like, um, we during the COVID, we, were, we also had a lot of problems as we were uh, in uh, located in the capital and more, many of the patients were in the island. So we also had to use, had to do a lot of uh, online consultations, had to rely on technology a lot, uh, did a lot of uh, online consultations as well. But the problem with, uh, the, the major problem that we faced was the insulin distribution uh, because, uh, the, uh, because of uh, the ge geographical locations, uh, and because of the capital was in lockdown for two and a half months, there was no way that the patients were able to travel to the capital to get the necessary insulins uh, that were needed. And we were getting uh, calls saying that oh, we have only one or two days of insulin left. So we had to work uh, really hard to provide the necessary insulins needed for the patients to stay alive. And uh, just like to uh, highlight that we we had uh, we had to come an agreement with the Maldives National Defense Force where they were doing emergency uh, transportation to the islands to provide the emergency needs and we had an agreement with them uh, and so we were able to provide the necessary insulin and the testing kits needed uh, for the patients in the island. Uh, just wanted uh, as I was talking about. Uh, the insulin distributions. These are how uh, the type ones are distributed around the country. As you can see, there are some atolls where there is only one patient. So it's it's very difficult for the government to maintain the the logistics uh, to provide the insulins to keep the insulins and uh, to make it available in the island. So mostly the insulins are available in the capital and. And during normal circumstances, the patients or a relative of the patient will uh, purchase, uh, will get the insulin from the capital and send it to the island. But this became a really, really big problem during the COVID-19 uh, lockdowns as there were so many patients in the islands who were really uh, finding it difficult to get the insulin, but uh, just we were really uh, happy that we had an agreement with the Ministry of uh, National, National Defense Force uh, to provide the insulin for the people, for the type ones in the island. Uh, 
Uh, I just wanted, like we have been uh, talking about insulin, CGMs and all that. I just wanted to uh, just take you through about how, how insulin uh, came to us and how. So uh, this, uh, in 2004, uh, we received a donation from Insulin for Life as an aid after the tsunami, which, which hit the region, Southeast Asia region in 2004. And I would like to highlight that this is uh, this is the like 16th year anniversary today. So 26 December is the day that the tsunami hit the Southeast Asia region, and it hit more and it devastated the, the islands in the Maldives a lot. So then uh, we got an aid from the, the Insulin for Life uh, where we received insulin pen. And this was the first introduction of insulin pens to the Maldives. So these were donated to the type 1 across the country. Uh, since we were formed in 2004, we were not really focused on type 1 diabetes. Mostly our patients were type 2 and we really didn't ha didn't have a lot of ideas about type ones and how many type ones were living in the country. So then, after the 2004 donations, we were getting periodic donations for insulin uh, for life from him uh, uh, for life. So here are some pictures of after the tsunami where we were able to uh, travel to some of the islands, introduce the insulin pen for the some time for some time some type one patients in the island, uh, visit the health centers and see how many patients were there. And then even in some instances, we had to have an impromptu uh, uh, screening sessions because there were so many patients and there were, they have been uh, without death, without any blood sugar uh, testing. So this was uh, in 2004 after the tsunami. So after, that insulin uh, donations, uh, we founded a program called Save a Diabetic Child Program, which was launched in 8th, uh, November 2008. And, and then there were around 32 patients uh, registered under this program. So these were supposed to, supported by some local companies, Life for a Child and Insulin for Life Australia. So we were trying to, pro uh, when we started uh, receiving these insulin pens, there were only valves and syringes in the country. And since uh, the Maldives are an island nation and we have to travel a lot in the thornies and boats and all, it was very difficult for uh, for the people to carry the insulin. And so it, it was really helpful for the type one patients with the introduction of the pens. And uh, so we were under this pro project, we were able to provide the insulin pens and the testing kits, which were needed for them to do the necessary uh, testing as well. Uh, but even though then most of the insulin are uh, available in the uh, capital as such. So at the moment, we have around 136 patients which are being supported on, under the project. Uh, here we would like to highlight that uh, since 2018, uh, insulin pens and needles are being supported under the universal health scheme in the country. And we were able to advocate to the government on the importance of the insulin pens and um, for the type ones on receiving the insulin pens and needles. So now it's uh, supported under the type international uh, universal health scheme. Uh, we also do uh, dive more this youth camp uh, camp for uh, the youth living in the country. As I showed you before, there were some type one patients. There were only one in some instances. There are only one patient living in in one island. So these patients have never met another person living with type one diabetes, and they really have no idea of how. Uh, are if there are other kids or other people who are living with diabetes and how they manage, they are never able to discuss or have a um, conversation with any other type one. So we started uh, this 5 j uh, camp targeting youth with diabetes between the ages of 13 to 16. So this provides the young people with diabetes with a unique opportunity to share and learn from others with diabetes. So the primary ob objective was to 
to provide the children and young people with diabetes with a fun but safe environment that allows them to learn about themselves and their diabetes to reinforce their current education and promote and for the development of management and coping strategies so they had the opportunity to interact with other young diabetes and it, it allowed them the youth to feel at ease and accepted in a community where having diabetes is the rule and not the exception and i just wanted to highlight that in uh, 2014 and 2018 this camp was help, held as an uh, maldives international youth camp where uh, young uh, type ones from uh, southeast asia region other countries including india participated in our uh, camps as well so here are some of the pictures i uh, just wanted to highlight from some of the uh, camps that we held in uh, different years so uh, just we, i i just heard about the insulin pump and the cgm so the the first pump which was introduced to our country was a donation to diabetes society of maldives from the czech diabetes association which was in 2013 so one of our young leaders idf young leaders received the pump as a donation from the czech uh, diabetes uh, association and uh, in 2013 and she was the only type 1 with pump in the country for uh, some time uh, we uh, have a lot of uh, faculty from india in our youth camps as well uh, talking about different uh, topics as well so in 2016 uh, um, uh, dr jyoti dev uh, introduced a lot of latest technologies in diabetes in in our youth camp including the C, uh, cgm and the pump as well so uh, we started insulin pump therapy for 10 youths with type 1 diabetes in september 2017 which was a really big milestone uh, for uh, in our endeavors to improve the life of people with diabetes and i would like just like to thankfully highlight that this, these pumps were uh, a donation from uh, jyoti dev diabetes and research center as part of their programs and um, uh, we uh, we were able to come up with an agreement with the national social protection authority of maldives uh, to provide these 10 young people the necessary pump accessory uh, accessories free of charge uh, under an mou with the diabetes society of maldives where we uh, report to the national social Pro protection agency about Uh, how their uh, quality of life is being improved with the insulin pump therapy just uh, wanted to oh, highlight hi. here a video hi my name is ali i have been a I have been diabetic for nine years, and I am Maryam Nafa, and I have been diabetic for three years. And we are students of, of Maldives and National and University. <laughs> Before insulin pump, we used to take insulin shots multiple times a day, and it was very painful, and it was also very difficult for us to control our blood sugars. Then, and after. the pump therapy we have seen a big change in our life it has been easier for uh, 
to easier to manage diabetes to control our blood sugars before we usually sometimes forgot to take insulin we don't know whether we took the insulin shot or not and there's no way we can check whether we took the shot but after the pump we can check the when our last dose was given so if the dose was not given we can set the dose and give at the time that it has make our life much easier to live with diabetes hi i'm nadia it's been 5 years since the diagnosis and last year i got the chance to start insulin pump therapy surprisingly i could go about with my day to day activities with the pump thank you so uh, these are some these are some ki- the kinds of videos that we used to ed- that we used to advocate for the government on, on the importance of the latest technologies and to make it, to make it available for the type 1 are living with diabetes uh, at present we are advocating uh, with the government with the policy makers to establish a national registry of all the uh, patients living in the country we are also advocating to establish a national diabetes uh, guideline uh, unfortunately we still don't have a national diabetes guideline and it becomes very difficult especially when uh, the treatment uh, varies from island to island and hospital to hospital since there are no national diabetes guidelines and uh, also we are uh, working to ensure the availability and uh, that even uh, even if there's availability in the country it uh, it's only available when it's only available in the um, capital of the country there's no accessibility of insulin for the type 1 patients living in the island so we are working with the policy makers and advocating for the accessibility of insulin for all type 1 patients living in the country and also to provide the testing kits to type 1 patients living in the country so i hope that uh, you got a little bit of information how we try to manage the diabetes and to provide the necessary education and to do the prevention uh, in a uh, uh, country where the ge- geographical uh, lo- locations of the islands make it a very difficult task to provide the necessary care and education thank you <laughs>